Merry Christmas, Subcity. So glad you could join us today. We're going to kick this service off with some worship. that you are, are a supplier of joy in our lives, that you are good and that you love us and that you sent your son uh, to die on the cross for us. So God, I just pray that our lives can be filled with joy that, that is from, from you, from, from your source of joy, from your hope. God, we trust you and we love you. In your name we pray, amen. Jesus, our Emmanuel. 
righteousness, light and life to all he brings, risen and healing in his wings, bounty lays his glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth.
you can have it all, Lord. Every part of my world. Take this life and breathe on. This heart that is now yours. Oh, the joy I found surrendering my mouth at the feet of the King who surrendered. everything that we are. We give you everything that we have. God, because we love you and we trust in you and we know that your ways are good and we know that, that the plans that you have for our lives are good. God, that you orchestrated a plan with baby Jesus to come to this earth to save us from our sins to be the savior of this world. God, we, we trust your, your way, we trust your promises, and we surrender our lives to you. God, take control of our lives. Speak to us. Yes. Let us know the, the, the path that you want us to go on. In your name we pray, amen. Man, I love worshiping together, especially with Christmas music. Now we have some announcements to help you stay connected. All right, it's the part of the show where we do announcements. So I'm just gonna jump right into it. First off, we got Beyond the Sermon. Now we've been talking about this the last couple weeks, so you might know the drill at this point, but in case you don't, we have a weekly series called Beyond the Sermon where we answer your questions about last Sunday's message. So if you have any questions or comments or concerns, uh, feel free to put those in the YouTube comments or if you're watching live over in the chat and we will answer them. 
on Wednesday's episode of Beyond the Sermon. So keep your eyes out on our YouTube channel and uh, check those videos out. And if you don't, I will take it personally. All right, next up is tithes and offerings. We want to say a big thank you to everyone who has continued supporting Hub City Church over the past year. Things have certainly looked a little bit different, but the church has still been able to do some really, really cool things thanks to your generosity. And if you'd like to give, you can do so online at thehubcitychurch.com give or by mail. And as you know, this is not the only ministry that you can support this season. There are several ministries around the world that we are supporting as a church through our Advent giving. Each week for the past three weeks, we've been looking into one of these ministries. And this week, we have a little video that's going to kind of summarize all three. And so we're going to roll that here now. Um, spoiler alert, it's also my voice. Uh, we probably could have planned it better to where the announcement and the Advent video were going to be voiced by two separate people, but we didn't. So you're just going to have to deal with that. All right, anyway, let's, let's just roll this thing. This Christmas season, we have an opportunity to support some of the incredible mission work that God is doing around the world through our Advent giving. This week, we'll be highlighting the three ministries that you can help support. The first is Germany Missions. The Brzee family moved to Germany three and a half years ago to plant new churches. Recently, they moved to the city of Cologne and have encountered several needs, including a large population of people living in poverty. The Brzees want to be able to bless them with warm clothes this winter and, of course, continue to build relationships as they prepare to plant a church. Secondly, we have Camp Amos. Camp Amos is a children's home in Chiapas, Mexico, which primarily focuses on children who are orphaned or have disabilities. It exists to give therapy, encouragement, teaching, love, and a sense of purpose. As they continue to provide their regular school activities, they are finishing construction on the staff and visitor cabin, and they have begun work on a well. The final ministry is the Friendship House in Mount Vernon. The mission of the Friendship House is to reflect the heart of God by feeding, sheltering, clothing, and healing to empower those in need. They provide two emergency shelters, a daily meal service that serves over 150 meals a day, and an employment training program to help people get a fresh start in life. The Friendship House not only meets practical needs, but provides a sense of hope. If you'd like to give to any of these ministries, you can do so online at thehubcitychurch.com advent. Thank you so much for your generosity. Okay, well, some really cool things happening around the world. And that's going to be it for me this week. Uh, But we still do have a couple announcements from Pastor Sean. So I'm going to kick it over to him. And until next time, have a good one. Merry Christmas, Hope City Church. This year we're having our candlelight services on the 23rd and 24th. But we're doing it at home. And so we're going to bring all this candlelight joy to your house. You got to sign up online to receive one of our candlelight packs full of these candles, glow sticks for kids, all kinds of fun activities and things and supplies so that you can engage and participate in this year's services. They're packed services and they're packed goodie bags all for you. Sign up online and we will drive them to you just as I am, but we won't light them when we drive to deliver them. We want to see you, connect with you, pray with you, and just say, Merry Christmas, Hub City! We love you! We're coming back, Hub City Church. Starting January 10th, we're going to start launching two in-person gatherings here in our sanctuary. We're going to be back in here. We're going to be socially distanced, masked up, all the fixings. We're going to have classes for our youngsters. It's going to be great for those that feel comfortable. It's a great way to connect, engage in the teaching, fellowship with other people. Meanwhile, at the same time, we will continue to always have our online gatherings. The church continues to gather both online and in person starting in the new year. It's going to be great. Save the date, January 10th. Looking forward to it. We'll see you next year. Today, we're continuing our series A Very Merry Christmas. Take it away, Sean.
Well, hey, Hub City, it's great to be with you today, and we are nearing the end of our Very Merry Christmas series. We've been looking at the life of Mary and all the things that she embraces along the way to to really get under this idea, this theme of embracing Jesus. She's embracing her calling, embracing risk, embracing the impossible. Uh, At our candlelight services, we're going to end it by embracing the moment. Today, we're talking about embracing the truth, the truth of who Jesus is. And it made me think of this clip out of, or the the whole theme that you see in the movie Elf, classic Christmas movie, and you have Buddy the Elf who leaves the North Pole to go find his dad in New York City. And right away, Buddy's dad does not believe that he is his son, right? That Buddy, there's no way Buddy could be his son. He dismisses him, he throws him out of the building with security, uh, even has him DNA tested, and throughout the movie, he's just keeping him at arm's length, and he's struggling to embrace the truth that Buddy could actually be his child. Then, finally, towards the end comes this climactic moment in the park where his dad finds Buddy and he admits to him, Buddy, you're my son, I love you, I care about you, and they literally, they embrace. He's embraced the truth, he embraces Buddy the elf, and they pat pat each other on the back and they hug. Well, when I was thinking about it, when Jesus comes into our life, we have a choice to dismiss Jesus or to embrace Jesus, to dismiss the identity of Christ and who he is, or rather to believe in that and and to allow it to lead to this lifestyle of embracing all of who Jesus is and embracing him in our lives. And we see as a part of Mary's story, Mary herself is confronted with the truth of who Jesus is. He's more than just a little newborn baby. He's more than just her son. There is the truth of who Jesus is. He's the savior of the world. And that is a truth that she has to learn to embrace. And so we're going to look in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 19. It's a longer section, but a very familiar section. We're going to read this together, all right? It says, And then, and there were the shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be the sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Verse 16, so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. That was, that was great. We made it. Now, looking at this passage, we see that Mary embraces the truth of who Jesus is, embracing the true identity of her son. In Luke chapter 2, verse 19, that last sentence we read, we read that Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. We're going to talk about the treasuring up a little bit later uh, at, during the candlelight services, but I want to I dig in on that word ponder, because here you have Mary seeing all of this transpire. These shepherds show up out of nowhere and tell her all this stuff. Oh, you wouldn't believe it, Mary. We saw angels, and we saw all this, and we saw that, and blah, 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 and this is what they said, and she ponders all of that. That word ponder is to deliberate, to think through, to examine in order to interpret right? It's like the jury getting together to deliberate on all the facts and, 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 and come to a conclusion. Mary is doing that right in this moment. She's pondering all of these things. She's processing all this information, trying to decipher all these messages about who is her son. And even in later on in chapter two of, uh, of Luke's gospel, we see her thinking through more of this as, as she takes with Joseph, she takes Jesus to the temple They dedicate Jesus as was customary of that time and they meet a man named Simeon and Simeon begins to just spout out all this praise to God about how the salvation that Jesus is going to bring to all people. And Luke records that Joseph and Mary marveled at the things that Simeon said. 
You see, even just a few verses later, here's a moment. They're marveling, they're pondering, they're thinking about all the things about who Jesus is. In Matthew's gospel, chapter 2, you think about when the wise men, the magi, show up at the house and, and Mary and the child are there, it says, and, and they bring him gifts and they bow down and they worship him. And Mary is confronted with these strangers coming into this home and, and worshiping her son, that he is the king sent by God to be worshiped and honored. And that's what Mary is pondering. She's facing all of this truth about who her son is, who Jesus' identity really is. And she has to reconcile this question, who is Jesus? It's an important question for all of us to reconcile. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But the truth is, as she's, as she's pondering this, deliberating on this, thinking about all this, processing it, she comes to the conclusion, Jesus is the Savior of the world. Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Chosen One that has been foretold for, for centuries that God would send to save us. That's Jesus. And there's lots of different titles that you can give to Jesus, Prince of Peace and Emmanuel and all these things. But today we're going to focus on this idea of embracing the truth of Jesus' identity as our Savior. As our Savior. And it, as we look at this, I think that this can be a complicated truth for us to embrace. First reason I think that, that this can be complicated is that we find ourselves focused on some other Savior. Right, that there is some other savior out there, and and at that time, the message that the angels bring is one that is going to sound eerily familiar to a message brought about about the Caesar of that time, right? And some other savior of the world that was going to bring peace to all earth, and it would have been very similar, would have paralleled a lot to the messaging that they would have heard about Caesar Augustus. Now, some historical context at that time, where they are. Uh, in the Middle East, is being ruled by Rome, right, over in Italy. The Roman Empire is ruling over this region of the world, even at a distance. And at that time, Augustus is the Caesar, and he is the adopted son of Julius Caesar, who after his death, Julius Caesar, is actually deified. He is officially declared a god after his death. And so Augustus, by association, is referred to as what? The son of God. Hmm, interesting. Here we go. Augustus is referred to as the son of God in that time. He is Rome's leader. He is the Caesar of this region. And this region has gone through civil war, and they've been embattled in all this division. And he declares peace. He brings this declaration of peace called the Pax Romana. And the, otherwise, because I don't speak uh, that kind of language, right? Back in the day, it's the peace of Rome. That's another way you would translate that. The Pax Romana is the peace of Rome. And so he brings this message, what? of peace. And as he brings peace to this whole region, people not only consider Augustus to be the son of God, Julius Caesar, but also now to be their savior because he's brought peace to their world. And so the rise of Augustus gets this message going, this viral content gets shared at that time, and they refer to it as good news. Or the other word that we would use a lot in church circles is gospel. The gospel of Caesar Augustus is that he is the son of God bringing peace to Rome and all the world. You're starting to see how eerily close that is, right, to the message of the angels. So the angels show up and they use this language. Language that at that time would have seemed very political, very cultural, a little jarring to hear. Wait a second, wait, 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 wait. You're telling me that Jesus is the Savior of the world? You're telling me that Jesus, this little baby in a manger, he's the Son of God? He's bringing peace to all the world? No. Are you serious? No. Caesar is that guy. Think about jarring and disruptive that is for them. It's as if they're using these popular political slogans and just inserting Jesus into it, right? Imagine if I took a, an Obama-era hope poster that we're all familiar with from when he ran his election campaign, right? And we just put Jesus in there instead, right? It's a little, whoa, okay, all right, here we go, right? Or we take a, a, a very famous Trump red hat, and instead of making America great again, we make Jesus great again. There's some that get on board with that, and there's others that would cringe at that. Others that would scoff at that or find that ridiculous in some way that, wait a second, you're, you're, you're comparing Jesus to the hope that Obama brought? You're comparing Jesus to the greatness that Trump brought, you know, you're just, you're inserting Jesus into these ridiculous scenarios. 
But the angels are bringing this message, and it is disruptive. And this disruptive message begins to reveal who that culture saw as their savior. And the truth is, when we look at the message of the angels, it begins to reveal the truth of who we think is our savior. Who is truly our son of God? Who is our source of peace? Who is our savior that we put our whole world into and our hope into? And, and, and we have to stop and think about that truth for a moment because that message is going to shake things up for us. And it reminds me of that scene out of Elf where Buddy shows up at the store to see Santa. He's so excited to see Santa. He knows Santa. And the guy that he sees sitting there on the chair is not Santa, right? And he begins to question him, well, what about this and what about that? And he's still not, you know, he's trying to figure this whole thing out. And then he, he what does he do, right? He smells him. You smell of beef and cheese. And then he pulls on his fake beard and the kids freak out. And then a big tussle and wrestling match breaks out. Right? But he has revealed that this is an imposter. This is a fake Santa. This isn't the real Santa. Well, the angel's message is doing the very same thing. It is revealing at that time that Caesar is not the real Savior. He's pulling on the fake beard with this message and saying, this is not the one to put your hope in. This is not the true source of peace for all of mankind. And the, true, the truth was relevant to them as it was to us now. 2,000 years later, the truth is still resonating with us in the same way. It's that we don't put our hope in Caesar. We might put our hope in a political figure, yeah. We might put our hope that they're going to bring change in a new way. We might put our hope and and all of our our trust and and find all of our peace in our spouse or a, a friendship, a mentor, a pastor, our children. We expect that they will be the ones to save us, right? And all these imposter saviors that we've put our hope into, we have to reconcile with that. And maybe it's not a person. Maybe it's a thing, right? Maybe it's our career, our house, our boat, our 401k, our Red Rider BB gun. I don't know what it is. But there's something or someone that we have, just like they did in that time, they put their hope in Caesar. We put our hope in people or in things. And the message of the angels reveals this truth of saying, that's not your savior, That's not your peace. That's not your hope. Your true Savior is Jesus. And in this moment, we see Mary pondering this, reconciling this, that Jesus is the one that we put our hope in. Jesus is the one that truly does bring peace to this world. Jesus is the one that truly saves us. This can be a difficult thing for us to grasp also, not just because we found ourselves believing in some other savior, but also that we look at ourselves and don't think of ourselves as someone who needs saving. Have we ever thought of ourselves as, "Eh, am I really someone needing saving? Because when I embrace the truth that Jesus is my savior, I have to admit that I need saving. To To be a savior, you need to save someone. And so that means I need saving. Right? I need to have my sin and my brokenness and the hell that I deserve. I need to be saved from that. I need to be saved from the death that I deserve and the consequences I deserve and the brokenness that I deserve. Jesus comes in and he saves us from that. But to admit that he is my Savior is to admit that I am broken and that I can't do that alone. And that is vitally important for us, but that is hard for us to sometimes reconcile and justify and believe within ourselves that we ourselves... Can we admit we need help? We can't save ourselves. We can't clean ourselves up. I think the reality is a lot of us function through life a lot like Clark Griswold trying to hang lights on his house. In the Christmas classic of Christmas Vacation, he's out there hanging up all the lights on his house. And who's helping him? Rusty's not really helping him. He's out there, every time you see him, he's out there doing it himself. He's on the ladder by himself. He's stapling things by himself. But what ends up happening? He's hanging onto the gutters by himself. He's falling off the ladders by himself. He's stapling his shirt to the house by himself. He's struggling to even turn the lights on by himself. He can't even turn the lights on without somebody else's help. And I think a lot of us are trying to go through life making our life better, making ourselves cleaner, purer, better. We're trying to save ourselves alone. And we have to be honest with ourselves that our sin and our brokenness leaves us hanging from the gutters of life causes us to fall off the ladders of life, leaves us frustrated, hurt, and alone. We have to admit our need for Jesus to save us. 
That is, that is truth that we have to embrace, no matter how difficult it is. The, the Apostle John talked about the importance of embracing this truth that he is our Savior and we need saving. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, John writes, he says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. John's getting to the core of the issue that we see in Mary's story is that we have to embrace this truth. If, 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 if we think we don't need saving, then Jesus can't be our savior. He can't put that on his business card. To put that on his business card to say Jesus is our savior, right? For the angels to declare that the savior has been born requires us to admit, yeah, I, I'm broken. I'm flawed. And so John says, if you're gonna say you, you haven't sinned, you're good enough, then the truth is not really something that you've embraced. The truth is not really in you. Because what we end up doing is we're calling Jesus a liar. That's what he says very harshly. It seems a little harsh, but in verse 10 he says, if you're going to say you have not sinned, then you're saying Jesus didn't need to come to earth to die. And that I don't need to be saved by Jesus. And so therefore, Jesus, that whole message of you being our Savior, that's a lie. It's not true. And his word is not really in us. How can I embrace Jesus fully if I can't fully embrace his identity? Something's going to be off. Something's going to be incomplete. It's like Buddy and his dad. It's just kind of awkward until he fully embraces the fact that he is his son. Well, I can't fully embrace Jesus as the king of my life and healer of my life and baptizer of my life and savior of my life. I can't fully embrace Jesus if I, if I keep him at a distance and say, well, but, but I, I'm still good enough, God. We have to admit our flaws we have to admit our brokenness. We have to admit our sin and our desperation. And that's the thing is, it, is it causes us to come to Jesus humbly, desperately, repentantly. And John says that if we do believe that, if we will grasp that truth, if we will believe that truth, if we will embrace that truth, what does he say happens in verse 9? Right in the middle of that passage we read, we would be forgiven, we'd be purified, we'll be set free, we'll be be given the hope and the life and the peace that God promises. Why? Because Jesus is faithful. And that's the, that's the reward there, is that as we embrace this truth, we experience closeness with God. We experience the forgiveness of God, the peace of God, the joy of God. The reality is, is that we are all confronted with the reality, we, we are all confronted with the truth of who Jesus is, but we won't always believe it. We'll reject it, we'll dismiss it, we'll replace it. You know, as Jack Nicholson would say, they can't handle this truth. That was my best Jack Nicholson. Let's try that again. You can't handle the truth. No, that's still bad. You do, you do your best. I'm struggling here. But you get the idea is that there, there is this truth that we have to grasp onto, to embrace. And for whatever reason, we can't handle it. We can't live it. We can't believe it. We see examples of this all throughout Scripture. Mary and the shepherds, they hear this truth, they embrace it. They, they, they live that, right? You see that and the joy that it brings and the excitement in that moment, the peace in that moment, the, the, the good stuff that we see. But you also see throughout Jesus' ministry, people are, are confronted with this truth of who he is and they wrestle with it. Is he really the Savior or is somebody else the Savior? Do I really need saving? Mm, and they go through all this. I mean, think about, you got the religious leaders of the time. They couldn't wrap their brain around Jesus being the Messiah. There's no way you're the chosen one. No way you're here to save us. You don't fit our mold. You don't fit our expectation. There is a religious leader in John chapter 3 named Nicodemus. We learned about his story a little bit. And this guy comes to Jesus in the middle of the night and he comes asking questions. He's trying to deliberate. He's trying to ponder. He's trying to think through this. He's asking questions. He's wrestling with some of these ideas and these concepts, right? He's pondering it. And he embraces this truth that Jesus came to save us, not to condemn us. You think about the criminals on the cross when Jesus is executed. On one side, you've got one criminal who scoffs at Jesus, 
oh yeah, Jesus, you could save everyone. You can't even save yourself. And he's there and he just, he can't embrace that truth. Meanwhile, on the other side of Jesus on the cross, you have another criminal who looks at Jesus and recognizes that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the one that saves us. He is the one that brings forgiveness to our lives. And, and he repentantly and desperately and humbly cries out to Jesus. And what does Jesus promise him? Today, you'll be with me in paradise. People constantly confronted with the true identity of who Jesus is. The disciples themselves wrestled with this. Jesus, at point blank, would just ask them, uh, hey guys, who do people say that I am? And who do you say that I am? It's one thing if other people say stuff, but he's more curious. He pulls the disciples and says, who do you say that I am? That's the question for us to wrestle with. Who is Jesus to you? That he's more than just a teacher and a philosopher, just more than a good guy, more than a healer, more than the guy that we go to to pray when we're stressed out. But he is our Savior. Mary embraced the truth that he is the Savior, the one true Savior that we all need. And she experienced the joy that comes with that. You look at that story and what do you see? You see Mary just filled with this joy in the moment. You see the shepherds running off through the streets shouting for joy. They're not scared. They're not, you know, timid about it. They're just filled with this joy. They've gotten to experience something with God. And that's the thing here this Christmas season is that we embrace the truth of who Jesus is. We embrace the idea, the identity. Jesus is our Savior. And we believe that, we encounter that, we experience that, and then we go and we express that. And that's how I want to just kind of end our time together is that idea of not only do we experience that for ourselves, but we express that to other people because you see that in this story, that we are embracing a truth that needs to be told. There is a truth that needs to be told. You've experienced something good news, something, something awesome with Jesus. You need to share that with other people. The good news is intended to be shared. The, the shepherds go running through the streets. In verse 17, it says, When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. They can't contain it. We've experienced this. We believe this. This is ours. We grasp this. We want to live this. We want to share this with other people. Mary herself, it says she not only pondered these things, but she treasured these things. Right, All that is being told to her, she treasures these things. She hangs on to it. Think about it for a moment here as we're reading this in Luke chapter 2. 2,000 years after it's happened, how did Luke know this stuff? He wasn't there. Think about it for just a moment. We're reading the gospel of Luke that this doctor, this author at one point wrote all this down. He wasn't present in the moment. So he either had divine inspiration from the Holy Spirit that gave him knowledge of events that he wasn't present in, which could happen, or he talked to somebody who was there, or he talked to somebody who talked to somebody that was there, right? He either found the shepherds somehow and Googled them, shepherds at the manger, and figured it out and talked to them, or he found Mary and talked to her, and they shared what they had experienced, or Luke tracked down somebody else that had talked to Mary, talked to the shepherds, and heard, wow, you should have been there. Wow, if I could have been there, I wish I could have seen it. I wish I caught it on YouTube, man. It was this incredible moment. Angels, words, singing praises. There's the baby wrapped up. There's the Savior of the world, the good news, peace to earth. Oh, there it is. Luke has all of this information to write about, and we're talking about it 2,000 years later. Why? Because the shepherds and Mary couldn't keep it contained. They had an experience. They had a truth that needed to be told. God has done something in your life. God has done something good in your life. He's healed. He's provided. He's shown up. He's saved you. He's brought peace into your life. What are we doing containing all that? What are we doing keeping that all locked up within ourselves? We need to be sharing these experiences, sharing these moments, sharing this truth of who Jesus is so that our world can begin to see. Because I tell you what, our world is searching. We're searching for saviors, we're searching for hope, we're searching for peace, and if, <laughs> if 2020 tells us anything, our world is desperate for peace right now. Our world is desperate to find hope right now, and they need the message of Jesus more than ever. But who's going to tell them? Who's going to tell them? 
today is not just about, yeah, Sean, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and he's in my life and he's my Savior and that's great. Awesome. If you feel you checked that box, great. Now I want to encourage you and pray for you and push you to think about who are you going to share that with? Who in your life needs to hear that this Christmas season? Because that is a truth that needs to be told. And that's how I want to end today. I want to pray for us in two ways. I want to pray for those right now that need to make a decision that Jesus be the Savior of my life. And secondly, I want to pray for us, church, that we would have a boldness to tell that truth with our community and with our world. Let's pray. Jesus, right now, we just come, we come humbly to you and, and, and recognize that you are the Savior of the world. You save us from our sin, our brokenness, our death. You save us from hell. Nothing purifies us, nothing washes us clean, nothing forgives us like you. I pray, God, that in this moment you would meet with us, you would, you, you would speak to our hearts and our minds with clarity and with your truth, and we would see you and, and see you for who you are. And we would embrace that truth that we need you, Jesus. I pray for a boldness right now in our church, God, that we would not be silent, that we would not be timid or fearful, but we would be people who humbly, confidently, and boldly share your truth, truth with the world that we are in. That your truth would spread throughout this community, God. They need your hope. They need your peace. They need you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Awesome. Well, church, uh, looking forward to next week as Christmas will be over and everything on the 27th. We're looking forward to uh, an incredible, just special, unique service. It's going to be packed with worship. We're going to have communion. We're going to do a guided devotional. All those supplies are going to be in your candlelight packs. And uh, I'm going to throw it to Caben because he's going to just highlight those packs one more time so you can get those supplies. Church, we love you. Have an incredible Christmas. Thank you, Sean, for another awesome service. Hey, don't forget to join us for our candlelight service on the 23rd and the 24th. Oh, and you can sign up for a goodie bag, which includes your candle and a couple other goodies, such as hot cocoa. Hub City, we love you, we care about you, and we will see you for our candlelight service.